you're a predator, how often do you need to kill an animal to keep you and your offspring or family members fed? What is going to what is going to give us the best outcome for changing the trajectory of the prey population? It is that's that's the most important thing, and, and that's how wildlife management works. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Stick Boat Chronicles, brought to you by Black Little Bows. I'm Rob Petuto, and he is Blake Hunter. Well, he sounded like a computer there, Mister. <laughs> Freaking lively, aren't you? Oh, you bet. You bet. Uh, what's going on, bud? Oh, nothing. I'm uh, started uh, packing today and getting getting uh, gear in order and um, making making sure everything's ready to go for season. Yeah, I was making a gear pile uh, today, um, and uh, you know, my kid was like, "Yeah, I'll help you." You know, he wanted me to get done so he could beat me up in jujitsu. So, <laughs> dude, he's freaking kicking my butt. It sucks. You're old. Well, no, it's like you know, he knows all these moves, so I just kind of like play the thug, right, beating him up. And I'm just not used to legs that strong. I mean freaking wrapping his legs around my head and putting me in all these freaking moves and choking me out and it's getting old you wrap your legs around his head you're going to cause permanent damage to his eyesight (laughs) (laughs) i i don't know what move it is that i I got him in though i I killed it i did i I curl him sir taps a lot no it's it's funny you talk about laying gear out and i swear every year i'm like okay i've got everything i need i don't have to buy anything next year yeah. and every yeah, <laughs> every year i get everything lined out and i've got to spend two or three hundred bucks buying stuff so anyways i was going with that it's, you know typical 13 year old i'm like hey yeah why don't you go in the, the the shed there and grab that um uh, that shovel and put it over here and it's like i can't find it i can't so he goes like down the barn and over to the other shop and this and that finally it's a crisis can't find the shovel i go to the first place that i told him to look it is right there just (laughs) oh my gosh uh that's me in a nutshell basically (laughs) (laughs) so anyways uh this is the last episode that i did by myself before you came on board so you haven't actually heard this one Mm -mm. yeah so it's toby boudreau and he's the wildlife bureau chief for the idaho department fish and game um, I'm very passionate about management in Idaho and I'm very proud of our department most of the time, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's part of being a sportsman, you know, being involved and you're not always going to see eye to eye. Uh, but the grand scheme of things, I think we've got the best, um, system in the country. Um, so really, really enjoyable for me to, uh, kick back and, and talk to Toby, um, we've actually, unbeknownst to us, uh, we, we realized at the end of the, uh, uh, interview that we've actually been in, in, uh, meetings when things got heated together. <laughs> so it was, it was good. It's a great talk. Um, originally I had tried to do it early on in the spring. Uh, things kind of got followed up with COVID. Um, I was super interested in talking to him about, uh, bear management because man, bears are so hard to manage. Uh, and I want to talk grizzly bears because I, 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 it's a, it's a big uh, topic here in the West, uh, with them, you know, coming off, off of, uh, the endangered species list and then back on and, and kind of the state they're in. Um, and I wanted, you know, this it seems to be an increase of, uh, uh, negative bear grizzly bear encounters with hunters. So you so talk bear safety some, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I touched on that. But actually, we get off the rails, and he talks about some fascinating stuff on uh, just management, you know, sheep and deer and elk um, uh, all across the board. Um, yeah, great talk. I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to shoot, uh, shooting the breeze with him again. Yeah, 100%, man. I'm looking forward to listening to it. Yeah, so uh, – Geez, let's see. That's going to go out this week. I think it's going to go out just about opening day. So opening day for me. Yeah. 
So yeah. if I follow up all the scheduling, these things are all going to drop on one day and I'm hunting for, <laughs> for a couple of weeks. So just enjoy listening and like, I'll, I'll catch you later, like a couple of weeks from now. So <laughs> yep. A hundred percent, man. There's going to be four, uh, four episodes dropping on Sunday at 5 p.m. <laughs> oh yeah. Hopefully this will get us through, uh, the first part of September and into, uh, into the last part of it. Yeah. I'm hoping that uh, zoom recorder shows up that you're yes. sending and, uh, me and my buddy will, uh, be recording up there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Put would, one out on that. Do, yeah. That'll be fun. Cause we'll be documenting his first year, uh, with a stick bow. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned it several times here on the podcast, but, uh, yeah, first time 30 years, Jake will be packing a, a stick bow. So, uh, hopefully he'll get it done with that, but we'll certainly be talking about um, his journey. Yeah, it'll be fun to hear his take on it and, and uh, you know, what's going through his head, the struggles, trials, tribulations, and, and so I'm, forth. I'm going to thrash him. <laughs> taking, taking a beating from him for 30 years about st- st- shooting a stick bow. Oh, that's thrashing funny. Thrashing him. He doesn't know it, but I am. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, let me hit the sponsors and we'll get out of here. Eh? Yeah. All right. Uh, big thanks to Selway Archery, The Footed Shaft, Kafaru International, and of course, Black Widow Bows. We appreciate the support from our sponsors. If you like this show, if you like what you're hearing, if you're here listening to it and you don't like it, I don't know what you're doing here. Uh, s- support those that support the show. We'd appreciate it. They'd appreciate it. Good luck hunting, everybody. 100%. Let's get out of here. Roger out. How's it going, Toby? I'm doing well, Rob, and yourself. Not too bad. And you just, uh, what, yesterday you just uh, helped draw some lucky winner? Yeah. So the Idaho Wild Sheep Foundation actually um, sells uh, tickets for the bighorn sheep lottery tag. So the legislature uh, has uh, allowed for Idaho Fishing Game to have two tags for sheep that. Uh, one is an auction tag that goes to uh, whoever puts in a, uh, a prospectus uh, on an annual basis. That actually was just awarded to Wild Sheep Foundation, the National Wild Sheep Foundation for next year. And then the other tag is for a lottery tag, which they sold over 18,000 uh, uh, applications for. And uh, yeah, they... We, well, actually the director, uh, Ed Shriver, drew the uh, winning name yesterday and uh, they handed us a check for $185,000 that goes to uh, sheep and disease uh, work here in Idaho. So nice, really, it- really great, uh, really great example of, uh, you know, sportsmen uh, paying for conservation beyond uh, their hunting and fishing licenses and, uh, gear and uh and ammo so pretty awesome and now is that tag good for any unit with a sh- uh with an open sheep season so that tag varies uh from year to year uh one in one year it is good for everywhere in the state except for unit 11 and then in the opposite year it is good for every unit in in the state including unit 11 which is hell's canyon so yeah awesome. which is we only have one controlled hunt draw uh, annually that goes in that unit. So, um, so yeah, and it and it alternates with the auction tag. So the year that the auction tag can be used in unit eleven, the raffle tag cannot. Oh, and vice versa, and gotcha. it goes back and forth. But gotcha. that's the most that they've ever made on a uh, on their raffle. Um, was 185 well actually they made 212,000 spent uh i think about 27,000 on uh, on advertising and uh yeah no and uh but that i think the sum total since 1993 when that tag went into place is they've they've donated 1.6 million dollars to sheep Ooh. and disease stuff so that's pretty wow. cool yeah that's awesome that is awesome and and that's something we'll get into i mean I, I do, we're, we're pretty fortunate in Idaho to have the system that we have. And, um, I mean the, the department that we have and it's the way it works with sportsmen's and sportsmen's groups. I mean, it's a really, uh, it's a good relation relationship for sure. Absolutely. 
Um, so, uh, why don't you tell listeners a little bit about yourself? So, yeah, I'm the chief of wildlife. Uh, I've been in this position for um, about a year and a half. Um, so that is uh, the division administrator for the wildlife uh, bureau here at Idaho Fish and Game. Um, I've worked for Idaho Fish and Game for about 15 years. Uh, I started working on mule deer when I came to Idaho and uh, then uh, transitioned to a couple other jobs and uh, finally ended up in a place where I think um, I've got the best job in the agency. I'm nice. pretty excited about it. Nice. Um, and you, uh, as we were talking, you and I actually have um, similar roots. You were born on the East Coast and uh, headed out west to chase your dream. Yeah, absolutely. I was born in Connecticut, of all places, and uh, left there when I was 19 years old to go to uh, school in Alaska. And yeah, I lived and worked in Alaska for two decades and then uh, got the great chance to come to Idaho and uh, and live and work here. And I uh, just absolutely love it here. Nice. Nice. So originally I, I had hoped to get you on and talk, um, gosh, about, it was in March and I was going to, I wanted to talk about bears um, and kind of think we got derailed because of COVID. Uh, so I got you on here now. And after we had talked, there's so many topics that I am interested to hear uh, your input on. Um, we'll, we'll briefly touch on bears, but I got a whole list to hear and, and <laughs> I don't want to keep your, your, uh, your time all day, but, uh, tell, tell me about your work with bears. Um, and you know, just a little bit about what it's like to manage bears because, you know, we know as sportsmen, you, you can fly, you can do aerial counts on mule deer and, and elk. And, um, how do you go about managing the numbers of bears and understanding, you know, what the population looks like. So I've been working with and around bears. Uh, I actually did my master's on grizzly bears in Alaska and worked on a black bear project there and managed black bears uh, in Alaska and then came to Idaho, of course. And, and we, uh, we, we definitely have an active uh, bear hunting, uh, at least for black bears um, and, uh, and manage those. So, um, you know, I think uh, those secretive species are difficult to enumerate. And uh, so as wildlife biologists, we've figured out ways to monitor that population through other means. And one of them is through harvest. And we actually look at the age of the harvested bear and look at the sex ratio of the harvest. So everybody that hunts a bear in Idaho and is successful has to bring those in and get them checked. And we check for evidence of sex. And the reason is, is because we need to know whether it was a male or female. And then we take a small premolar tooth uh, so we can get its age. And basically we use um, metrics. In fact, we're probably in the next couple of years going to be venturing into rewriting our, bear, our black bear management plan. But right now we are using metrics like the percentage of females in the harvest to make sure that the percentage of females doesn't get too high or you would be adversely impacting the population and also making sure that you maintain an older age structure by getting those ages every year. And we collect those teeth uh, from spring all the way through fall and then send those in and, uh, and get those aged at a lab uh, actually in Montana uh, is how they do it. And they cut them they slice them just like tree rings and uh, stain them and read them. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, quite fascinating, and you know you can. We've had bears, uh, or at least I've seen black bears that have been as old as thirty two years old um, that have been harvested in the wild. Uh, man, um, is that something? You know, when they pull that tooth, is that something uh, a person could do? You know, at at home with a Dremel tool, could you pull one of those teeth? Is it or is it? take a lab to, uh, to administer and all that stuff. I mean, just for a guy wanting to know on his own. So we, we do it anyways. And, uh, and we, we send it off and pay for it to be. And if you shoot a bear, um, in Idaho, about six months between when you, depending on when you shoot the bear and bring it in to have it checked, um, it's usually six, six to 10 months before we get the age back, but you can call us up. And if you have the, the number that you checked it in on the, um, oh, yeah. 
we can actually look up that number and tell you how old that bear is. Now, could somebody, if they weren't in Idaho uh, and didn't have, and their state didn't have a bear aging program, could they take that tooth um, and send it in? They absolutely could. I think that the technology, I mean, basically you have to use special stains, put them on a slide, uh, and then uh, you have to have a, at least a dissecting microscope to be able to read those lines. It's, it's pretty fascinating technology. In fact, the gentleman that sort of perfected uh, a lot of aging in, a, in the United States, uh, he actually figured out through known bears in which years he could tell a bear, a female, had cubs. Um, and uh, because they lay down a little, di little bit different line and he had known bears with known litters. So he actually went back and looked at those over time and found that he could tell in which years a bear actually gave birth to a litter because, you know, it's, it's, it's taxing on the bear's body to, of course, carry those cubs and deliver them in the, in the den and, uh, and feed them while she's uh, in some state of, uh, you know, uh, semi-hibernation, which, you know, for bears is called tor torpor. Oh, that's right. I, I actually, actually not true. It's not true hibernation. Yeah, I actually had a uh, a guy on the podcast about a year and a half ago, and he schooled us on that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. uh, no, that's awesome. Um, now, how come you have to check the hides in? I always found that curious. So the the hide check is really uh, for evidence of sex. Okay. So we gotcha. can determine which sex it was. Gotcha. Um, you know, it's uh, it's pretty apparent to the hunter. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, hunters are 99%, you know, accurate. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we like to verify that because it is so important to managing bears and making sure that we do a good job of uh, managing that uh, proportion of females in the harvest because you don't want your, you don't want the female proportion to be higher uh, because then, um, you know, that's basically the, the ones that are, uh, putting off offspring and, you know, black bear probably doesn't even breed until it's four or five years old. So uh, making sure that you have bears that are older uh, in, you know, in the population and knowing that and knowing the proportion of females is basically how we manage bears hmm. and, uh, and adjust seasons accordingly. Do you guys often, um, are you guys uh, darting in the den? You guys doing any of that stuff? Um well, uh, funny that you ask. We actually started a new study this year, or last year, actually, with a grad student out of the University of Idaho, uh, where we're looking at bears uh, and looking at, uh, um, we, so we are collaring some bears, and we collared bears uh, last year and this year. Um, we will not be going into their dens to collar them again. I have done that before. It's really fun um, and interesting work uh, to uh, uh, crawl, crawl in a, in a, in a dark and cold den, uh, in the, in the late winter and, uh, and dart an animal that's half awake and half asleep. But no, we, th we did that work, a bunch of it, uh, in the eighties, uh, in Idaho and, um, and we haven't done any, anything lately, but we do have some radio collar bears out there. And if people do harvest them, uh, please bring the collar back, uh, and, uh, we'll be able to redeploy it sometime in the future. Do you think people, when if they harvest one, they they think they got in trouble? <laughs> like, oh no! <laughs> um, I, I I think some people resist uh, shooting a collared animal because they don't realize that it's just as legal as any other animal. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we we spend an exorbitant amount of money to put a radio collar on a critter, but that doesn't mean that it's off limits by any stretch of the imagination to somebody hunting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um. What are you looking for? It, it, like, is it a 50, 50 generally, um, male, female? Is that, is that pretty standard or for harvest rate? Yeah. Uh, no, it's usually more like about a 70, 70, 30. Really? On males. Yeah. 70% 70, males, 70% males in the harvest. And that is because females with cubs are protected. Oh, well, duh. You, yeah, that's, you can't that's my bad. <laughs> with, yeah, no, yeah. It, it's, uh, yeah, so it's uh, it tends to be males. Males tend to be more bold about 
uh, going in places and, and having a little bit higher risk activities and uh, which lead them uh, often to be harvested. Yeah. And then uh, you guys watch the cow calf ratios and how do you, you know, as far as elk, how do you guys, you know, in- intertwine your, your bear population and your elk population? Well, we definitely watch cow calf ratios. Uh, in fact, one of the exciting things that we just started doing a couple of years ago is actually estimating uh, ratios with uh, cameras. So we have places in Idaho, especially like where you live, that we can't we can't fly. Uh, the weather is uh, often uh, during flying season is often terrible, and uh, even if we could fly, um, the timber's so thick that you can't really see down through it. Um, so that is re- so we developed a technique uh, about six years ago. Had a grad student uh, work on it that we used camera based estimate and and uh, actually then had that same grad student work on it and say, well, okay, we can estimate the population in a given area, like an elk zone. Can we estimate the, their, their um, proportion of cows and calves and, uh, and bulls to cows? And, uh, and sure enough, it, it, the, it worked out. So we've actually started doing that more. Uh, we also fly aerial uh, surveys for elk about every four to six years, every zone gets flown um, throughout the state. Um, and in those areas, we're now instituting camera stuff to look at, at calf-cow ratios. And, and for sure, um, you know, you don't know the fate of what happened to that calf. Um, but we do know, uh, and we have been doing more uh, what we call neonate studies, where we go and collar brand newborn calves and fawns. We've actually got a program um, in North Idaho where we're looking at whitetails, where we put in these uh, transmitters into whitetails does that when they give birth, uh, it gives off a radio signal and a location of where the birth site was. Wow. And uh, it's linked to her collar. And um, then we go in there and collar that fawn put a radio collar on it. And then when something happens to it and it stops for more than four hours, it sends us an email or a text or both and says, I stopped moving, come find me. And uh, we, we go back in there and do the, the fate analysis of what happened, what, you know, sort of a CSI, uh, you know, who, who done it. If, if it died, um, sometimes they Sometimes the radio collars fail, uh, but uh, definitely uh, look at what that cause specific mortality is because there, we have a suite of predators in Idaho, depending on where you are, and it could be any one of those. It could also have been uh, an accident. Um, uh, I worked on a study where we did that with moose calves, and you know we just had things drowned. Uh, you know, just had a moose calf drowned and, uh, and, and other things. So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting uh, work, but yeah, we do look at what is actually, um, what's actually uh, causing the mortality. And, uh, you know, one of the exciting things that we're working on now um, with our research group is actually looking at sort of a combination in area, in some areas of the state, we're looking at collared mountain lions, collared wolves and collared bears and looking at when you, and, and, and in some places where there aren't wolves and where there are wolves to look at what is the, what is the predation rate? If you're a predator, how often do you need to kill an animal to keep you and your offspring or family members fed? And does that change in places where there's three or four predators to where there's only two predators, like a a mountain lion black bear um, system to a mountain lion black bear um, wolf grizzly bear, you know, um, system. And does that change? So the idea is to look at if we were gonna move forward with management actions to benefit a prey species, what is going to what is going to give us the best 
the best outcome for changing the trajectory of a prey population. And that is, that's just fascinating stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, it, The technology is just incredible. When it works, it's phenomenal. Uh, yeah. You know, we've had a lot of problems with radio collars. Uh, we did a sheep program and uh, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, you know, we had a complete failure on every collar <laughs> and they were a, a three package collar. So it was a U collar. It was the transmitter that comes out when they have a, a birth and a lamb collar that we, we bought all together. So what the idea is, is that the, the U collar is sort of the mothership. It talks to the transmitter that would fall out when the lamb was birthed. And then the oh gosh. Uh, lamb collar to keep it light actually talked to the U collar. And it was a complete and utter failure. Um, they were telling us the collars were telling us that they were being given birth in March, which was not true. And, uh, we verified that. And, uh, anyways, it was no, uh, no longer do we buy equipment out of China. <laughs> well, um, we, we, we don't buy any radio collars, uh, out of there, but the components definitely come from around the world. Yeah. And, no, I'm uh, just joking. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge and we've, uh, We've really worked hard to try to get the best radio callers we can uh, and GPS transmitters. And, and I, I think we're doing a good job. I mean, they've got a transmitter now that is a cell phone linked transmitter that we put on a Pelican and uh, near Blackfoot, Idaho, actually in the Blackfoot Reservoir. Uh, that Pelican lived there for about 60 days and somebody thought, well, the, the Pelican must have died or moved off. Well, suddenly it got high enough that it hit a cell phone tower and dumped 1,600 locations to the, to the file. And then uh, another pelican that had that same radio transmitter uh, was seen, uh, was, well, was actually, we witnessed it on the, on, the, on the map going all the way to Sydney, Nebraska, to fish in the Missouri River. So, um, so yeah, we're learning some pretty incredible things out of, you know, these are transmitters that... Uh, would fit in the side of a pack of gum. Man, you know, uh, it's funny because as you're talking about this, you and I had talked yesterday kind of at length and the uh, subject of the Garmin Zero uh, uh, site came up. Well, there's an example of uh, um, technology at its at its worst and then technology at its best in the field. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, another one is the inReach, you know. Yeah. What a, what a great piece of safety equipment. Uh, until you make sure that you uh, don't inadvertently hit the "please come help me" button, <laughs> you know. I think I think that's the Garmin Zero, right? Is that that's is that that site? Anyways, we were talking yeah, about the, the site. The, yeah, the, the, there's a Garmin uh, Bow site. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that. Um, uh, so, well, let me ask you this. Now, I know that some units recently, and I, I say recently, five, six, seven years, um, some units have become two bear units. Now, what triggers that? So usually that uh, that is triggered by the fact that we have a predation management plan in those areas, mm -hmm. and we are trying to reduce um, the prey numbers to uh, help, uh, are trying to reduce predator numbers to, to increase prey numbers. Yeah. yeah. So it's that, uh, so yeah. So we've given people an opportunity to harvest uh, one more bear than they normally would have, but all of those areas actually have a predation management plan associated with them, and we're um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that hunters uh, are in, are as part as much a part of the solution as anything in uh, in trying to manage those predators down to benefit prey. Now that's triggered. Uh, I'm assuming is that that's triggered by your cow calf ratio and you're maybe uh, uh, looking at the elk numbers. Yeah. So basically every elk population has an objective mm -hmm. uh, and it has an objective for cows and bulls and calf ratios. And when they're not meeting those objectives and they've, they've gone below uh, those, uh, those limits, then um, we look at those and uh, then seriously uh, make modifications to try to 
get us back there. You know, one of the, you know, elk are one of those species that, uh, you know, in pl- in certain places, you can manage them with hunting. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have definitely uh, changed hunting opportunity in places and seen increases in elk. And we've seen other places where, um, you know, there's too many elk and we increase hunter numbers and we can surely uh, take those down um, in places. But those places are usually areas also that aren't heavily laden with predation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and then we go the other way by limiting hunters and, uh, you know, and increasing uh, opportunities for, for harvesting predators to try to balance those in the places where there's, uh, where elk numbers are low. Now, uh, speak a little bit to what uh, the, the difficulties or what the approach is um, on some of the backcountry units. Like, so not just wilderness. I mean, wilderness in its own right is you know, I'm assuming difficult to affect uh, predators, but you know, some of this country is um, fairly inaccessible, even though it isn't uh, uh, a wilderness. Yeah, and and definitely, you know, uh, you know, managing uh, wildlife uh, in uh, in legal uh, legally defined wildernesses is 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 is, is definitely a, a different. Uh, different thing. And, uh, and it's got some, it's, it's got some struggles, uh, for sure for us to, uh, you know, and we've been, uh, but we, we work well with our federal partners for the most part to put on and monitor, uh, species, uh, in, in remote places. But, you know, that's one of the things is I think that is great about Idaho is we, um, we do a good job of, of managing throughout the state and monitoring throughout the state. Um, you know, some of those places don't get a lot of pressure by hunters, but we still care about how many animals are on the ground and what that, uh, what that all looks like. I, uh, I think that, uh, um, yeah, we can adjust hunting seasons, um, and we can, uh, um, Cat, you know, of course, with elk, we uh, we have areas that we have put in uh, capped z- zones. So, uh, capping is the first level in the elk plans that I've been part of. Uh, you know, elk elk cap capping an elk zone is the first level of reducing opportunity to see if we can change the trajectory of the population. Um, and we uh, we have done that in in several places. And all capping means is that we're defining the number of people that can go there uh, by a given number, and they're, but they're still first come, first serve. They're not a controlled hunt. You don't have to apply to get them. You just have to stand in line, uh, you know, you are, or you have to wait to buy one of those tags, and they're not unlimited because we have many zones that still have, for residents, an unlimited number of, of tags that they can go to, so uh, elk, elk zones that they can go to without having a... a, a uh, a limit on the, on the number of tags, uh, especially for residents. Yeah. I don't think anything's changed in your setup there, but I'm getting some feedback, um, from your computer. Uh, there's a guy mowing the lawn out there. Maybe that's what it is. (laughs) Okay. It's not horrible. It's not horrible. Um, I I apologize. I, no worries. I, yeah, no worries. Um, how about grizzly? Uh, let's see. I hit over, um, yeah, I kind of hit everything. Now we're really fortunate in Idaho, just real quick. Um, our methods of take, uh, as far as, uh, bears, you know, uh, we, we can do it with bait in areas. We can do it with dogs, uh, spot and stock. Um, you know, recently there was a, I don't know the, I don't know where that lawsuit, I was trying to get a hold of the sportsman's Alliance to find out how that lawsuit was progressing, uh, that the Western environmental lawsuit brought forth to ban bear baiting in Idaho and Wyoming. Do you have any idea where that's at? And, and tell me just briefly what it would be like to lose that method of take. Well, yeah. So there is a federal, um, lawsuit, um, to, uh, basically for Idaho and Wyoming, as you said, on national forest lands Mm -hmm. and, um, Basically, the federal um, 
the federal judge dismissed, uh, there were two sort of claims. One is the, um, is the, um, was it the grizzly bear portion? It, it, it was. It was. It was litigation regarding the, you know, the National Forest Service's policy to consult with, uh, uh, yeah, and it had to do with grizzly bears and incidental take of grizzly bears, um, was sort of the way it was written. Um, where the lawsuit is right now is a uh, federal judge dismissed the NEPA claim in the lawsuit uh, earlier this year uh, that allowed. Uh, um, but had allowed the ESA claim to proceed. Um, and uh, since then, um, you know, Idaho and Wyoming, the states thereof are uh, interveners in the case, um, but they, uh, the judge actually denied the state's request uh, until she rules uh, on the preliminary motions. And the uh, federal government is actually uh, Got a motion to dismiss uh, the 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 other part of the of the lawsuit. So it's currently the 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 federal government is uh, is supporting a motion to dismiss the the case. So nice. we'll see where that goes. But it's still in the courts. And uh, and I guess if we lost uh, baiting on national forest lands, um, you know that would be uh, that would be pretty big. Um, yeah. You know, baiting is one of the most selective methods of uh, harvesting bears because you can see exactly what is out there. Uh, it, there isn't, uh, it's not an incidental uh, occurrence. It's not an incidental uh, encounter. Uh, it is something that's very planned. Um, I mean, Chucks, I know, I know people that are so, so serious about it that they actually put a string at their bait and uh, you know they've from time from from you know they've been doing it for so long that they know how to measure a bear if his if his back hits the string or pushes the string up that it's you know it's at least a six foot bear and nice. uh, and I, I think it's 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 fascinating you know it also uh, eliminates uh, you know uh, misidentified bears um, it also eliminates uh, people from uh, harvesting bears with uh, with cubs of the year because the cubs often come into the to the bait uh, at some time and and I, I think uh, I think a lot of people that don't know or have never done baiting I think it's you know they have images that aren't necessarily the case in of reality they, yeah. um, but it's 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 a it's a it's a great tool that uh, that we use here in Idaho to uh, harvest bears and and I think. It is. Uh, it is something that uh, it would be. It would be. A, it would be a loss for us if if, if that. Um, went yeah, away. yeah. That's like I likened it to somebody. And recently, I said, "Man, that's like sending." You know, if was Idaho was to lose that, I said, "That's like sending a plumber out to do some gas pipe, but taking his pipe wrenches." <laughs> you know, like <laughs> go do this job, but we're going to take your tools away. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it, uh, it it is another tool in the toolbox that we use, and I think uh, we'll, we'll see where it all goes. But hopefully, this uh, motion to dismiss. Uh, well, then again, I mean that's in my experience um, involvement with sportsmen's groups in Idaho. It just makes me proud. Um, to look back at the times that we've, um, you know, of course, there's not a lot the sportsmen can do with a federal lawsuit, but I don't remember it was 96, 98. We had a big, big uh, push to uh, ban, I think it was spring bear, or bear baiting, bear hound hunting. And man, the sportsmen just, you know, they rally. Even people that don't partake understand that, you know, it's, it's important for our department to be able to manage. So. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and, and and national group groups got involved. Um, yep. um, yeah, and I, and I know that uh, uh, other states even sent money to support those yeah. efforts because yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, um, you know, how I wanna... people can manage uh, species through some a ballot box, and it's really not that's not wildlife management um, yeah. at its best, and and I, I think that. Uh, we we can do better than that and and uh, and yeah we uh, 
I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but um, we're, we're standing at the edge of the hole for a minute. So I'll, I'll just bring it up. Uh, Colorado in their, um, their impending wolf introduction or transplant or whatever you want to say, it looks like it's going to go through, but you know, I look at them and, and they don't have a spring bear season. I look at how you guys have approached um, areas that, you know, were impacted pretty heavily by the wolves. You were trying, you know, you're, you're lengthening the lion seasons. You guys are, um, you know, adjusting your bear take. Um, and for Colorado not have that tool, I just go, Oh my gosh, you know, not only is it bad for them, but it's bad for the surrounding States because we're going to get hit with non-residents in 10 years. Like we've never thought possible. Well, and you know, uh, you know, as far as non-resident management goes, you know, Idaho has a, uh, we have a cap on the number of non-residents that come to Idaho for hunting. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the future plans uh, in a little bit, but yeah, I mean, obviously uh, the people of Colorado want uh, wolves to be augmented into their state. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things is, is Colorado has already documented a known pack uh, in uh, Northwest Colorado and um and a single in a completely separate other, other area. So they're there. Um, yeah. Whether they move a forward, um, if indeed the ballot initiative passes, uh, whether they move forward with some plan, um, I, I is uh, we'll, we'll we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I don't want to go down rabbit hole, but it was worth mentioning. Yeah. Uh, grizzly bears, you know. Uh, this kind of ties in like last fall I, or last summer about this time, I really wanted to talk to somebody about grizzly bear safety. Um, you know, I, you know, uh, I did have somebody from the department on, we talked a little bit about it, but first off, explain to the listeners um, where the grizzly bears stand today on and the um, endangered species act. Where, where are they at today? So uh, grizzly bears were delisted in 2017 and we, Idaho, uh, you know, set up for a hunt uh, starting in 2018. Um, that delisting was actually uh, litigated and they are now back on the list. Uh, they are back on the endangered species list. Um, you know, the, the, the amazing thing is, uh, and I have to say that, you know, the work that the states and the people who recreate and the people who live in grizzly country in uh, the greater Yellowstone, you know, have done an amazing job. I mean, we have recovered bears there and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. And the states, you know, um, basically the day-to-day -day management of bears and bear conflicts and bear um, safety education and bear um, bear research, uh, for the most part, are done by state employees. Uh, there is a small group of USGS uh, researchers that work on the Greater Yellowstone, and there are a couple of Fish and Wildlife Service employees that uh, basically um, consult with the states on act activities. But we're we're doing the work and. Um, not to say that we're paying for the work, that actually the work is being paid for through federal dollars, uh, through something called Section 6, which is um, endangered species money. So um, sportsmen uh, don't have to worry that they're, they're, their license and, and uh, PR dollars are not being used for those, those purposes at this time, but, but the states are definitely doing the work and, and it's pretty incredible. So right now we are still, uh, bears are still listed. Uh, we have uh, just got a recent decision out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We appealed um, the uh, the delisting uh, decision, and that court basically um, said there were three things that we had to do to get bears um, off the list, and those were a uh, a commitment to recalibration. And basically, what that means is that there was a there's been a model that's been used to estimate bear populations and uh, there have been some, and there are in process right now, improvements to that model um, that actually will show that there are gonna be 
probably a higher estimate than currently exists. A higher and number a, of bears? A higher number of bears than what we had thought. It be, the, the model inherently underestimated bear populations. What, what, what is it? And that's a good... And that's a good thing, right? Uh, yeah, and cur- so currently there's, uh, you know, the estimate I think last year was 718 bears in the greater Yellowstone demographic monitoring area. That doesn't count all the bears outside of the, of the demographic monitoring area <laughs> in Wyoming, in Montana, and in Idaho, but uh, 718 within. And uh, so uh, a commitment to recalibrate, a, a commitment to make sure that if there is some genetic uh, limitations on the population that the states will agree to uh, moving bears around to increase uh, genetic diversity. And then the third one would be to, um, is basically, is the remnant analysis. So basically, um, and this was a, a function of a case that came out of the District of Columbia District Court uh, on the Great Lakes Wolf that basically said that when you delist a population, you have to consider what's left in the rest of the area um, and is there a viable population. So the remnant analysis would be that, you know, is what's left after they delist a distinct population segment, is that a viable population? and uh, and so it's uh, those are the three things that would need to be covered, and uh, we're hoping that uh, we can move in that direction and uh, fix this um, the delisting rule right now and uh, and move forward because uh, as I said, bears are a uh, recovered species. And recovered species uh, need to be turned back to the states to be managed appropriately. And it's not like any state wants to get rid of bears because we'd just be back on the list. Uh, but we want to be able to manage bears and, uh, and, and all those things that we currently do without the oversight uh, of a uh, Endangered Species Act. Now, I, I fess up on this podcast a lot. I mean, I am just a knucklehead. Right. I just, I I enjoy hunting, but I'm an idiot. So how frustrating is it for you guys to look at a species like um, the grizzly bear? And I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, I had a long friendship with uh, Jim Hayden uh, and he was a a regional biologist and and years and years and years ago, he said what a, um, a cap on his career or something to that effect would be how great it would be to someday uh, have a grizzly bear season, you know, like, so you're the, everybody's working towards bringing the number up. The, the, the North American model of conservation, um, has worked so well for decades. And we look at, look at moose, look at, um, you know, the wild Turkey and, and those just two, um, species that come to mind where we went from basically zero to having a viable population and, and all of that that comes with it. And here's it's you guys' job to um, to manage the wildlife, and when you do, to get you know kicked back again and again and again by, as far as I'm concerned, a frivolous lawsuits. That's got to be so frustrating. Well, it's it's all part of the process, Rob. And you know, it's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, yeah. I, I I have to say that you know it uh, it's a shame to have a species that uh, at least in a certain part of its range in the lower 48 is definitely recovered um, and it still be delisted. Um, but, you know, we're, st- we're still there. We're still working on bears in the greater Yellowstone and, uh, and we will continue to do so. And I think that uh, um, it's, uh, Does I think th- we really need to focus on the fact that this is a, huge success story and we will get through this yeah. and uh, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, Jim Hayden's uh, you know, idea of having a, a, a grizzly bear season, that means that they have recovered and they're back in the hands of the state, which I think is really the, it, it is, that's, that's the most important thing. And, and that's how wildlife management works and whether it's uh, antelope or bison or alligators or go or bald eagles, um, you know, there have been a lot of species that have come back from the brink um, and basically all done by sportsmen and conservationists who 
know that, you know, and, and I, I think that's, that's one thing that people don't understand. Uh, the average person who isn't a hunter, uh, who's never read a, a book about it, that who pays for conservation? It's, you know, we're a self-funded agency, which isn't the case for every state, uh, but we're self-funded and we hunting tags and licenses and uh, the federal uh, tax for, uh, you know, firearms and ammunition and archery equipment basically pays for all the wildlife management that happens in this state. So it's not the people that, you know, necessarily pay uh, property taxes that they don't contribute unless they buy a hunting license yeah. than they do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, in sportsman's groups, I mean, you think about, uh, like Rocky mountain elk foundation. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to come up with all that deserve to be mentioned, but you know, there's so many organizations out there that, um, sportsman's groups that, you know, fund and, and just, you know, keep these issues at the forefront. And I'm just, I'm, I feel very blessed to be in Idaho and to understand how things have worked. I get frustrated. Don't get me wrong. I get frustrated now that I have your phone number, buddy. <laughs> um, I get frustrated at times, but overall, I just I feel so fortunate to be in the state, and uh, I think you guys do a great job. Uh, and, and and you know, I would also like to say that you know a lot of those big uh, NGO groups, uh, the the elk, the deer, the ducks. I mean, those guys are in the fight with us. Yeah. Uh, SEI. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've told that to, um, I've got good relationship with, uh, the CEOs around here. You know, I, I stay in touch with them. A couple of them are friends and, um, you know, I've for years of, once I meet them and talk to them, I always say, Hey man, like we're your best asset, right? Like we're in this together. You're, you're one person for how many hundreds of square miles, right? I'm on your team. Like we're, we're all in this together. And, and I think that, that it should be that way. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, you know, regulations i mean really it's about compliance and uh about gaining compliance and 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 people um people you know having peer pressure that gets people to follow them oftentimes boy you said it right there you know i wrote a little piece years and years and years ago uh that was in a, a traditional boner magazine and it was about exactly about that me and a buddy he's like a brother we still hunt together today but you know we end up packing two elk out <laughs> We kill two elk August 30th. It's opening day. It's going to oh be, God. it's forecasted to be 90 degrees. We did, he didn't know I shot one. I saw him shoot the other one. And so we get these two elk down. We end up three miles downhill from the pickup. So do the math, three loads. We're talking 18 miles we're going to have to do to get these elk out. And uh, he makes the joke that, well, you know, I, I, I have the key to the gate because there was a gate there. In his job, he had a key, but it was a joke. And at no time would either one of us done that. But when you were running with a, a people with not the same ethics and uh, morality, that uh, that's how people get in trouble. You're like, well, okay, you know. And so you hit the nail on the head. Know the people you run with. Yeah, and uh, and it uh, yeah, it's it's always a challenge to do the right thing. Never lost a piece of meat off those two elk either. Um, grizzly bears. Uh, it's fascinating. Well, first off, I want to back up. The Greater Yellowstone does that encompass the cabinets? No, no. Okay. So there are um, currently, um, you know, there's the Greater Yellowstone, which basically is that corner of Wyoming, uh, Montana, and Idaho, uh, of which eight eight percent of the Greater Yellowstone um, population is in uh, Idaho. Um, <clears throat> then there's the Northern Continental Divide, which is sort of that uh, Glacier Park South okay. uh, country. Um, and then there is the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirk Ecosystems are two separate ones. Uh, so there are four occupied uh, ecosystem or distinct population segments as, uh, you know, designated by the Fish and Wildlife Service currently in Lower 48 that have bears and uh, bears occupying them. Uh, just, I, I didn't really catch that. So the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirk are two separate um, 
uh, bear populations? Well, they are as designated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, I think that there is uh, exchange of bears between those two areas uh, that uh, that you know we as a state are working to sort of uh, bring awareness to and make sure that we uh, we I mean uh, ultimately Idaho wants to recover all the grizzlies that touch Idaho mm -hmm. um, and those populations. And I think, um, and we're, we're working hard to do that. Yeah. Cause we, there was a lot of this one in North Idaho. Yeah. There was a lot of money spent and uh, awareness brought to what do they call them? Wildlife corridors between the uh, uh, cabinet and the uh, Selkirks, you know, up through Bonners Ferry and all the way down there. They, they were, there was, gosh, was it, uh god i can't remember the name of the organization but they were buying up private property there and designating it a wildlife corridor and that had been 15 years ago but you know. yeah and you know we actually continue to do that work uh, looking at uh places that we can um ensure safe passage across you know roads and 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 interstates and you know i we're actually starting a, pro a project uh looking at elk movements uh between the cabinets and the Selkirks right now. We just oh, called really? our first elk uh, over the winter. Yeah. And looking at where they go and to see if, uh, you know, we can potentially get some crossing structures to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a dual benefit. Of course, it's good for wildlife, but it's also um, a public safety thing and, and trying to make sure that, you know, uh, no, nobody in a, in a, in a Corolla wants to, you know, kiss the belly of an elk run across the road. So, um, you know, yeah. human safety and uh, getting animals across back and forth. And, you know, it, one of the interesting things on the wildlife corridor, uh, it's not like they're usually single species. Multiple species yes. all travel the same thing. So whether it's a bobcat or a black bear or an elk, they tend to travel those same natural routes. Sure. So we're, we're doing some work to identify those and prioritize those and working closely with the Idaho Transportation Department to actually um, figure out plans to how we can how, how we can get that wildlife across the road without uh, without hurting people or uh, harming the wildlife. Yeah, there's been some creative um, creative architecture, <laughs> um, you know, in uh, trying to mitigate that for sure. Uh, so. Back to grizzly bears. Um, speak to for a minute. Speak to why you think that it seems to be the last few years um, increased uh, grizzly bear problems with bow hunters in specific. Um, and and how? Yeah, just, just speak on that. And and what can people do to uh, you know somebody tra traveling out from Kentucky and and you know what's their level of awareness and what's the What's the risk? I mean, <laughs> assess the risk. Well, I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, I think that the reason that we have more incidences of people in conflict with bears and whether that's during hunting season or outside of hunting season, I think it's a relative to the fact that we have more bears. Yeah. The bear populations have gone up and, uh, you know, it's, Oftentimes, uh, you know, bears are making larger forays, especially young, uh, young bears, uh, the three, four year olds are making forays uh, into places that aren't necessarily what we consider grizzly bear habitat and getting in, getting in trouble there. But, you know, as far as from a hunting perspective, I think really um, having that situational awareness that there are bears in the area. And, and acting appropriately. I think there's a lot of great, uh, you can look on the IGBC website, which is the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee website, and there's lots of bear um, safety videos and safety links, the pamphlets. Um, you know, even though you're carrying a bow and you might be carrying a handgun, if you're hunting in grizzly bear country, I think it's a great idea to carry bear spray. Yeah. Um, Bear spray has saved a lot of people from a lot of, of, of bad things that could have gone 
even worse. And I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, the Island Park Zone, which basically is just outside of Yellowstone, um, that was the first place I'd ever heard of anybody hunting elk from a tree stand um, because it's safer. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it keeps their scent higher um, and, uh, and, and, you know, they have less worry about a grizzly bear. Although I will tell you that grizzly bears can climb trees, uh, despite the uh, wives' tale. Um, Dang it. They don't climb them as well as black bears, but they can climb. I can verify that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just think people have to have that situational awareness. And when they are coming from a state that maybe doesn't even have any bears uh, or just black bears, uh, understand that, you know, it's, uh, it's a different dimension and you have to be mentally and physically and equipment wise prepared to deal with it. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, it's completely safe to hunt in bear country. Uh, you just have to do it smart. You have to hang your food. You don't cut, you don't cook in your tent. Don't store the bacon underneath your pillow. Uh, you know, <laughs> I get time off for a second. Time off. Did you hear that? Brian Burkhart scentless bacon. There's no scentless bacon. Don't use it. <laughs> That's <an> inside joke. <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah, just, just be smart about, about camping and, 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 uh, and hunting in bear country. And when you do get an animal down, um, you know, get it out of there. Uh, move it away from the carcass as quick as you can. Uh, or move the carcass away from the gut pile as quick as you can. And, uh, and, and definitely uh, having that situational awareness of as you're taking an animal apart, having that bear spray on you, uh, ha you know, and being aware and having somebody always looking up. Um, and, and, and hunting in pairs. I think that's another thing that is sort of left uh, to people's devices. But I think that really um, there are less, there are much less opportunities for bad things to happen if you're hunting with another buddy that has the same awareness and understanding and equipment that you do. Um, so you're, you're, you've got four sets, of, you've got four eyes. And, yeah. uh, and I think that always helps. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and, and how you act, if you see a bear, you know, uh, you know, definitely, you know, read the literature. Um, it's based on thousands of bear encounters and a lot of people, uh, interviews to, to help people understand that you can recreate in bear country and you can do it safely. Uh, you just gotta be smart about it. And, you know, I, there's no shame in walking through a thick brush, patch uh you know you know saying words like hey bear um you know or wearing bells uh as you're packing in or packing out um it's i i think those are all great things that people can do to be safe in bear country yeah one of the uh one of the things that we have here in north idaho is you know oftentimes neck deep huckleberry brush and you know those in september the higher country uh might you know the lower countries the berries are already burned off you know and it's a prime food source so when you're in these uh, higher country uh, uh berry patches that's where the bears are <laughs> guaranteed every time <laughs> yeah i mean they're they're trying to put on their winter fat reserves and uh they are eating uh at a rate at which uh you know most hot dog eating contest winners couldn't even fathom and uh I'm you know, and, and absolutely. I mean, if you see a big pile of steaming berries, um, if the hair doesn't go up, go up on the back of your neck, um, maybe you should consider uh, a little bit more flatland uh, opportunities. Uh, yeah, that's when things are going to get serious. You know, uh, like up here in unit one, um, there's parts of the, I guess what I'm going to say is there's parts of the state where you expect to see grizzly bears. So they're on your mind, right? You're not afraid of them, but they are in the forefront of your mind. Like, Hey, uh, this is a uh, grizzly country. Now, last year, I think it was last year we had a grizzly collared grizzly travel all the way to the Selway. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We so had a bear that was moved from the Northern continental divide population to the cabinets. And then uh, he woke up uh, 
and got out of his den and walked all the way to Highway 12. Yeah. And he is now back in Montana in the Northern Continental Divide. And there again, that's a great example of a young four-year-old bear making a foray into a place that, uh, you know, was not typical bear habitat. We had another bear that was photographed on a bear bait camera um, outside of Grangeville. Mm -hmm. Um, And we went in and found the bear bait, um, found uh, found some hair, sent that off, had it identified, and surely enough, it was a grizzly bear. Um, interestingly enough, because, uh, both the fish and game agencies and the, and the U S fish and wildlife service and the USGS mark enough bears that they actually had a genetic sample from this bear from when it was a yearling and it was born in the Selkirks and it was born in the Selkirks and it traveled over and spent time. It had a radio collar on it, spent time, uh, on the Thompson River, <clears throat> and then ended up outside of Grangeville. And uh, there again, it's a four-year-old bear, and he is—he um, hasn't gotten in trouble, and uh, we haven't got any pictures of him from this year. But uh, yeah, it's—he's got, uh, got wanderlust. <laughs> That's yeah, good. And, That's good. And, and they can go incredible amounts. I mean, and really, it's—I uh, think if you followed the path from the Selkirks to the Thompson River down to Grangeville, it's only like 225 miles straight. It's not that far. Yeah, it's not that far, but when you take into consideration, you know, bushwhacking, but for the listeners now, the Selkirk is the range between Idaho and, and uh, well, it's kind and of Washington. on the, yeah. And it's it goes all the way into British Columbia. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a range on the uh, western edge of northern Idaho. And then when he goes to the Thompson River, that's in Montana, so he's crossed um he, he heads east quite a ways and then turns and goes uh, yeah, pretty good jag the, back into idaho he crossed the kootenai river which is giant he cap, crossed the cabinet mountains uh which you know are significant and then made it all the way to montana and then came back to idaho and we don't know where he is now but i imagine uh he's somewhere in between yeah and, and where i was going with that was um being prepared so you're prepared to uh bump into a grizzly bear in unit one or maybe like you're talking down an island park but when they're reaching um new um new areas like this bear is you know you got to be prepared i i would be stunned you know if i'm unit hunting unit five or seven or something you know maybe not so much seven but some of these units you would not expect to bump into a grizzly bear so as a bear hunter, I'm going to tie this all in. This is going to be beautiful. <laughs> so as a bear hunter, you better know your target regardless. And you guys have a fantastic uh, bear identification um, unit on your website, don't you? Uh, we used, Well, actually, I don't know if that's actually functioning right now. Um, but we have in the past and we're going to get that back going again. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Definitely, um, there's lots of aids on the um, on the internet for telling the difference between a um, a brown black bear and a brown bear that's a grizzly. And uh, and I think that uh, that's a great point, Rob, because uh, we don't want people to misidentify bears. And uh, and it's uh, it's 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 I, I've seen some really dark grizzly bears. Yeah. And that looked almost like a black bear. And I've seen um, black bears that have blonde hair and dark feet. And you'd think, oh, that looks like a young grizzly bear, but it's not. And there are, you know, there's a lot of identification techniques that with a pair of binoculars and hopefully not close enough for your own just regular (laughs) eyes, but you can quickly decide whether or not it's it's a grizzly or a black bear and uh, and getting that information i get again is important uh, for you as a hunter and for uh, and and for and for the you know the long term uh, conservation of bears yeah we had uh, myself and another guy um years back ran into a bear in the head of one of these major major drainages we thought it was elk coming in we were bow hunting 
Um, we heard him coming. You could see the alders laying down and, and, uh, he pokes his head through, stands up on a log and it's a, and it is, if it wasn't black, it was as close to black as you can get. It's a grizzly and he's got a big old ear tag in him. And uh, I talked to some of my, um, CO buddies at the time and, and, uh, they kind of figured it was out of Canada because it was not a shape tag that they would have, they were familiar with it all, but yeah, they're out there. And I think we had an incidental kill. It was tragic, uh, tragic incident several years ago, uh, North of Bonners, North, east of Bonners, I believe a hunter was killed. Um, and, uh, what, what had happened was they, they misidentified a grizzly and it was black. Uh, do you recall that one? Um, yeah, that was the one on Buckhorn Ridge. Yes. Yeah. And that that was was actually, um, interestingly enough, uh, that was 30 feet into Montana. (laughs) Uh, if, uh, it it gets worse. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, where that actual incident happened was actually 30 feet into Montana. And uh, yeah, that was super unfortunate. Uh, um, yeah, it was a misidentification and yeah. And it got worse from there. And it, and it, and it went down precipitously, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to touch on safety a little bit because it, do, it does have to be intimidating for um, uh, somebody from back east that's never been around bears, let alone grizzly bears. They're not out to eat you, but uh, situ- I think you nailed it when you said situational awareness. Um, keep your head on a swivel when you're working on a gut pile, for sure. Yeah, and you know, I, I think uh, most uh, bear and you know most negative bear encounters are you know um, that bear is defending something, whether it be it feels like it's young or threatened, or its food source or threatened. So if you're going through the brush and you smell something uh, that very raunchy and, you know, rotten, um, chances are you should probably back away from that. Yeah. Don't go and investigate. Um, you know, obviously, if you come upon something and you see it and it's buried, um, that's a classic uh, bear uh, type of caching of, of, of a dead animal. Um, you know, if it's strewn about, you know, that's one of the things we do with our CSI, you know, our, our sort of investigation of a, of, of a mortality is, is who did it. And, you know, you can tell that the mountain lion did it because of the way they actually, you know, they, they bury their, their prey also, but they definitely have some very distinct techniques that they use as they're uh, eating the carcass. Black bears and grizzly bears definitely have their own techniques and wolves have a completely separate one and you can tell the difference. But yeah, I mean, situational awareness could be even the sense of smell because um, yeah, if you smell something rotten, um, don't, you know, and you're in heavy brush, don't, don't go out there and look for it. Um, it, It's probably something you don't need to see and uh, don't need to, uh, don't need to prove yourself with a bear that's trying to defend that uh, pile of meat. And I'll, I'll just, let me, I'm just going to interject something here. Cause and we have mentioned it before on the podcast, uh, meat care. Now when you, when, when uh, Toby here speaks about um, uh, moving the, um, moving the meat away from the carcass, that, that'd be like, you know, get your bags of meat and getting them a hundred, hundred yards or something away, get them up, cash them because, it seems like 90% of the odor is coming off that gut pile and all of that. So if you've got to come back the next day, uh, for, for, um, for another load of meat, you don't want it near that, um, uh, near that gut pile because, uh, that's going to draw them in. If you don't have to, yeah. If you don't have to go back to the gut pile, I guess that's the uh, point. And, and game bags, uh, you know, with those strings, they will support all the weight that you can put in a quarter bag. And, uh, I think they're, they're, they're phenomenal and, and, uh, and the air is going to help, uh, dry out the meat and get that, uh, put a nice skin on it. And, uh, I think it's a benefit for everybody, uh, to do that. Now I've got two more topics on my list and I'm, I'm, I'm understand your time is precious. Um, you got time for one of them, one of the two, you know, I Rob, I have whatever time you need. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have anything on my, uh, on my dance card right now. So whatever you need, we can do. 
Well, you know, you 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 mentioned something my listeners would find fascinating about the Alaskan exhibit. But before we get to that, um, do you mind talking a little bit about hunter dispersion? Uh, do you mind alluding to what's coming up next year? If if not, that's that's fine too. Yeah, no. So what we're what we're calling it is actually you know uh, is hunter congestion, and what we've uh, what we've when we redid the mule deer and the whitetail deer plans. We asked hunters a lot of different questions. Um, I don't know if you took the t- quiz, the, 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 the survey or not, Rob, for either one of those. But um, one of them was, what, what, is, what are your thoughts about hunter congestion? And, um, and it came back that there, were some, there was quite a bit of folks that said that they've had issues with Basically, the, the the mountains too crowded, yeah. And uh, of course, everybody points their fingers at different things. Uh, the first the first finger is pointed at uh, you know non residents and non locals, and um, so Idaho Fishing Game took that seriously, and we moved ahead with some. Um, rule language to give the commission the ability to limit non-resident participation in general hunts. So we've always had for the last at least three decades, a limit on the number of elk tags and deer tags that non-residents can buy. Now, is that number changed? Uh, Elk tags specifically? Yeah. That's what I found amazing. I didn't know that that number has stayed the same for decades. Yeah. No, the, the number has stayed the same. Uh, and, um, it's, uh, 15,500 deer tags and it's 12,985 elk tags. And that has not changed. Uh, so there's always been a limit on that, but what, what, uh, what folks ask for is, you know, how can you limit them in my unit? So we moved forward rules through the legislature, well, the commission and uh, move uh, rules forward through the legislature, which got approved. And those will allow the commission to, if they decide to limit non-resident participation in general hunts. Um, Now the commission is still working through that process as is not set a a percentage, Um, but um, the way, uh, you know, we have worked out um, sort of uh how do i say this basically we have designed a a rule set so the commission can reduce the number of non-residents by game management units so in if they move forward with that i mean covid has changed a lot of things but um i'm anticipating they will move forward with that and they will there will be a limit on the number of deer tags for each game management unit that has a general hunt in it. Now that will not affect residents. Residents will still be able to buy a, a regular deer tag and you can go and uh, you, you, know, you could come south and hunt mule deer in October and still go up and hunt whitetails in your home country uh, later in the year. Um, but so- for resident for non-residents it will limit them and um the idea is to do it unit by unit and then of course all the elk zones that are not capped or not 100 percent controlled will also get limited down to a percentage and some of those places uh have fairly high percentages of non-residents uh some of it is historic and some of it is uh you know, sort of a recent influx of more people going to one area over another because it got good publicity or their buddy went there and had a good time. So, um, you know, and, and sort of the target we're looking at is is 15%. And people say, well, why not 10%? Um, I think that, uh, um, I think 15% is a, uh, would be, a, is a place to start and look at how this actually works see and one of the things that we're doing is actually doing a survey of resident hunters 
before. So we did another survey, a more detailed survey about Hunter congestion and did a, where in fact, the results are just preliminary right now. We just got those back and we'll be able to resurvey folks after we reduce non-resident participation by game management unit and zone and look and see is, have we solved the Hunter congestion problem? Yeah. Is it, is it because you see a plate from somebody from another state? Um, you know, we also ask people to define, um, and, and the, the, the results of this uh, survey report will be on our website sometime. But like I said, the numbers are super preliminary. And the report, I think, is, is uh, expected uh, in mid-fall by the researcher. We actually have a, a human dimensions researcher um, that we're helping pay his salary at the University of Idaho, who's, who's kind of engineered the work and, and the questionnaires and, and the analysis. So <clears throat> looking at, you know, we had people define what is a, what is, what is a non-resident because it depends where you are. I mean, it could be somebody from another County uh, <laughs> that you don't like. Uh, it could be somebody from another state and really defining uh, with the limits on non-residents, um, has that changed the complexion or people's thoughts? I mean, we've got units that have, you know, 20% of the people that hunt there are non-residents. If so, we reduce that by 25%, what is that going to look like? Um, and, and will that help? So, so if I understand this correctly, then the number of t- non-resident tags will not change, but they're going to, or you're going to uh, disperse them more evenly throughout the state? No, it's, it's not about dispersing. It's about, uh, you know, and that's, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking. It's, this program is not about a redistribution of hunters. It's about capping the number of non-residents in places. Okay. We, uh, I shouldn't have one of, one of the things, and, and, and it's two, two ways of looking at it, and I, I get where you're coming from, but we are not, uh, we're not anticipating that people, if they can't come to unit X, that they'll go to unit Y. We, 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 don't, we don't necessarily think that they'll do that. Um, and if you set everything at a percentage of say 15%, there aren't enough elk tags and deer tags to actually fill 15% statewide. Okay. So it, it's, it's really about addressing the issues in those places where there is a preponderance of non-residents coming and making that number smaller. And, you know, we've got elk units that, uh, you know, have 35% of the people coming are non-residents. So I, I, I misspoke then. It's, you're, not, you're not reducing the number of non-resident tags. I meant to say non-resident, right? It's, so it's the same amount statewide of non-resident tags? <clears throat> it, it's the same amount. Okay. But like I yeah. said, it will, uh, I don't, you know, people get so locked into hunting a unit or, or an area and if there's, if we limit the number of tags from a hundred down to 20, I doubt they're going to go to the next door neighbor unit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's going to be some sort of, uh, you know, process where non-residents figure this out, but we, we have no doubt that there will be less non-residents hunting in Idaho and that will take effect um, if the commission moves forward, of course, they still have one more decision point um, in November. Those tags for non-residents, remember, go on sale December 1st mm-hmm. of the previous year. So those, those, effect, those tag numbers will be, you know, if the, if the commission moves forward, that will be uh, adjusted for the December 1st sale, which will affect the number of non-residents going to game management units for the next fall, the fall of 21. Yeah. But just to save, just to save you and I a little heartburn, the bottom line is, you know, you mentioned you'll have no doubt that less non-residents will come, but it's not because you've changed the overall allotment. They could go someplace else in the state, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's just so. They could. And and the other thing that we're doing um, to sort of balance it, to remain fiscally neutral, 
is there's also a fee increase mm -hmm. uh, associated. So uh, non-resident uh, tags are going up in price. Non-resident elk tags uh, are currently $415 and they're going to go up to $650. Yeah. And uh, deer tags will be going from 300 to um, 350. So, and, and that's stay in pace with the neighboring states. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're look, we, we look at all our, and compare to all the neighboring states um, to look at uh, where they're at. We don't want to cost us. I mean, the, the, one of the interesting things that most people don't understand is that non-residents, if you take deer and elk hunters together, make up about 13% of the hunters that hunt in Idaho. Okay. And they pay about 55% of the license fees that we take in. Yeah. So 13% of the hunters are paying 55% of the bill. And uh, as a self-funded agency, we needed to propose to increase uh, fees, which the legislature did approve. And that it isn't about making more money. It's just about balancing it. So we looked at what are there going to be the projected decrease in non-resident elk tag sales? And what are the projected decreases in non-resident deer tag sales? So what can we make the prices to be to fit so we, we remain neutral? Yeah. And, uh, and we'll see how it works. And I, I think the, 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 as I was talking about the surveys, pre doing one pre-changing um, the non-resident uh, proportions, doing one after we um, change non-resident numbers to look and see if we still need to take other other measures to make uh, to to really manage for 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 Idaho residents. Uh, yeah. We have a uh, we have a mandate that's in statute to manage for Idaho residents first, and that's what we're doing. And one of the limitations that you know people have said, well, what took you so long to do it? One of the limitations was, is we didn't have a licensing system that could really handle it. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, we're, uh, that's the other thing that we're moving to uh, November 1st is we're going to have a new license vendor. And there are uh, a lot of exciting new things about this license vendor that is going to be, make it a lot easier for hunters uh, to communicate with licensing and to buy tags and to, um, uh, look up their profiles and to check draw odds and all that. Um, yeah, they're definitely, uh, it's, we're, we're pretty excited about the new licensing vendor coming on, uh, November 1st. So, uh, so that was one of the limitations that really held us from moving forward. Earlier. So, so speaking to the non-resident, um, you know, uh, say overcrowding for a better, better term. Sure. Um, it's not, you know, I was just, just minutes before we started this, I was talking to a friend over in Minnesota and, uh, you know, he's a non-resident and he hunt, he's hunted Idaho last four or five years. Um, he's not coming back this year and it was, and he killed an elk last year with his bow in Idaho, but he's not coming back. He's like, it was just insane. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it's not just not, it's just not it's not just residents saying, Hey, we don't want non-residents here. If you come from out of state and you spend the amount of money to get here and you come here and it's, it's no fun. Like this guy, he's not coming back. Um, it's, it's about a good experience for everybody, not just the residents. A absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, hunt quality is a lot of things and it's not always just pulling the trigger or letting an arrow fly. It's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of things that make up a quality experience, you know, I mean, as a bow hunter, I mean, I hunted eight years straight with a bow um, and only actually brought an animal home once, but, you know, I just couldn't, couldn't sleep waiting for the next <laughs> archery season to come along to chase elk again, because it's just such a magical experience. And, and yeah, so there is a lot of the hunting experience that is, uh, that, that, that comes into play and it's, it, it is, uh, and, and yeah, I, but I think that, you know, ultimately by statute, we are, we are supposed to manage for residents first and that's what we're doing. 
and uh, and we uh, we are hopeful that uh, it will all work out and uh, and provide a better opportunity for everybody that gets to come to Idaho. And yeah, it, yeah, and and just just briefly, you mentioned you know some somebody might have had a good year in a unit, and then uh, you know that's why people show up. But social media today, uh, all it takes is the wrong photo. Or all it takes is somebody that doesn't have a clue to say, man, look at this buck I killed, you know, or look at this bull I killed. And you can, especially magazine writers or podcast hosts, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was, I witnessed an area getting thrashed because a high profile person uh, killed a great mule deer buck. And, and I'll speak to that. The two not, the buying two tags, I think is wrong. Uh, being able to buy two deer tags or two elk tags. Um, that's Can't a, do that this year. No, 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 no. We're all um, sold out. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, that's that's another topic. But anyways, uh, coming in, in the, this person had killed two great mule deer bucks out of the same unit and then publicized it. And I watched the next two or three years it become a zoo over there. And, and it was unfortunate. Yeah. And, you know, I think that is something that uh, happens everywhere. It's not just in Idaho. Yeah. Um, and I, it's unfortunate uh, that people, um, you know, publicize those things. One of the most interesting things moving uh, to uh, the Southeast uh, Idaho was, you know, just the amazing hunting that's there. And mm, yeah, I mean, it's not, not well publicized. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's until great you just place, said it yeah. uh, you know and uh, and Idaho in general I mean it's just uh, you know people and and people uh writers especially you know they discount uh Idaho and it's you know animal quality and everything else and and uh I don't think uh you know that that definitely has an impact and all of a sudden somebody gets their picture on the cover of some famous magazine and everybody thinks that there's one of those behind every tree. Yes. And uh, yeah. I wish that were true. <laughs> I, I have a friend on here often. Um, and he's a uh, kind of a heavyweight in the, uh, in the hunting industry. And when he's from Colorado, we go back and forth all the time, you know, and he's sending everybody to Idaho. And I always say, ah, they should go hunt Colorado. We had an older gentleman gentleman on, one day and he was talking about his his one and only elk hunt and it was in Colorado you know and, and this guy's in his mid 70s and he's fondly recalling the hunt and he says man we blew that grunt tube that bugle the first time and and he's in Colorado and there was an elk bugling behind every tree <laughs> I, I used that for the intro of the show <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so that's a running joke here um yeah it's uh yeah, it, it it is it is pretty amazing that uh, um, what people uh, what people's perception are is based on things that they read or hear. Yeah. It, uh, so I uh, so much appreciate you coming on here, and and I really really want to get you on again. But if you could take just a couple minutes to close the show out, and none of this heavy heavy talk about game management, but you brought up something about a, an exhibit that you had seen in Alaska, and I think the uh, listeners would find this fascinating. Oh yeah. So it was, um, probably, it was probably, well, I moved to Idaho in, in 2005. So it was probably somewhere around 2000. Um, I lived in, uh, well, I was actually, uh, in and out of Fairbanks. That was my regional office. I was living in Western Alaska and, uh, there's an older gentleman that the university of Alaska museum, um, basically contracted to build, um, hunting tools. Uh, from when uh, from when he was a kid, and uh, he was a he was a Gwich'in man, uh, which is uh, uh, an Indian uh, tribe that uh, lives in the Upper Yukon. And uh, anyways, it was a fascinating um, presentation he gave. But you know, he made uh, you know he, the tools he made were a bow and an arrow, and and he talked about the arrows being specific because uh, those folks. Uh, for the most part, lived on waterfowl as a summer diet, and uh, it was a it's a phenomenal water waterfowl production area, and uh, and to be able to or be allowed um, by the elders to hunt waterfowl, you had to be able to make a an arrow that's 
that four inches of it still stuck out of the water after you uh, missed them. A so it floated. And, uh, it floated, so you could uh, you could go back and uh, and pick it up and retrieve it. And uh, and the other uh, the other tool he made was a uh, was an atlatl, which I thought was fascinating. Um, that here was an eighty five year old man who, uh, as a kid, they that's what they still used. Wow. Um, as as a as a as a tool to harvest uh, game. So. And those uh, items are still on um, display or in some cabinet. Uh, I don't know if that display is still around anymore, but the University of Alaska Museum uh, is one of the most amazing uh, natural history museums for people of the North uh, that you could ever go see. There's a, <clears throat> and, and a lot of tools uh, that were used by, uh, by those people that came across on the Bering Land Bridge and survived on uh, on critters back then so pretty pretty cool thing but yeah it was uh, fascinating uh, to meet somebody that grew up uh, that the best thing they had in their hands was a bow yeah and, and what did somebody asked or, or, or one of the museum purveyors asked why that stuff wasn't around anymore yeah they asked him why they uh, why, why they didn't save uh, you know copies of their old bows and he said well simple uh, First off, we're a nomadic culture and we live between fish camp in the summer and hunting camp in the fall and winter camp someplace else. Uh, so we moved a lot. And uh, the second thing was, is uh, as soon as something better came along, we got rid of it and uh, <laughs> went, went to the better technology. Yeah. Yeah. And which, then, which in that case were firearms. Yeah. And then uh, what were they using for uh, arrowheads? Uh, they, they actually, uh, the gentleman uh, fashioned arrowheads out of a moose femur <clears throat> so uh you know moose femur bone is really thick and uh one of the things i i asked how they got it so white and they would uh, actually split those bones and then lay them in a lake and all the bugs and insects would uh, eat the eat, eat and clean up the bones and uh, the next uh, the next year they were just bleach white uh cool it, it looked like ivory but it was really uh, just super dense femur bone Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Those, uh, those, those guys, people like that, you know, even in your own community, the uh, 70, 80, 90, even a hundred year old, sometimes they're like an encyclopedia, you know, and when one of them passes, it's to me, it's like losing an encyclopedia, uh, what those folks have seen and done. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I hung out with a guy who made snowshoes and he'd been making snowshoes for 70 years and he had a hand drill, a, a knife, and a couple of a uh, couple of sort of patterns for his uh, cross pieces, but you know just how they pick a tree to um, to cut down to make snowshoes. You know it had to be a tree on an exposed area, so the wind blew it back and forth. And they really, they, they, yeah, and because <clears throat> well, he was making them out of birch, yeah, and uh, and and you had to find a birch tree that not in the middle of the forest, but on the edge of the forest. That got blown back and forth, and he would, uh, he and, and a hatchet he used, of course, and a and a spoke shave. He had a drill, a spoke shave, and a hatchet, and a knife, and a couple of patterns for the cross pieces, and um, and he would go up to a tree and take his hatchet and hit it, peel the bark off, and then grab some of the fibers of the tree, and if they came off straight, that was a good tree to cut down to 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 cut to make uh, snowshoes up. Wow. And their snowshoes, you know, of course, uh, the finished length is 60, 60 to 64 inches long because the snow is very, very fine. Wow. And they have to be super long, even though these people weigh, you know, uh, you know, these folks are weighing 125 to 150 pounds. They need super long snowshoes to keep them afloat in the, in the deep, deep snows. And, and they would, uh, you know, of course, string them with caribou babish for the for the tails and for the for the toes and then underneath where their foot went they used uh, raw hide from a moose to because it was stronger yeah that's awesome stuff that is awesome stuff uh i know i'm gonna get people messaging me it's like hey you got to get that guy back on <laughs> <laughs> and i'll tell you all you, you you i've got your phone number now <laughs> Uh, now I'm, uh, no, yeah, I'm LinkedIn, no, no. but no, I, I really appreciate you, um, asking me to be on here, Rob. And, uh, 
and uh, I, I love uh, love talking about what I do and and uh, what we do as an agency and uh, and what we're doing to make things better. I think that's super important, and getting that message out um, is uh, is super important to what we do because we work for you. We work for the citizens of the state of Idaho and the rest of the United States and the world. And uh, you know, I think that uh, providing um, opportunities to hunt, fish, and trap, or you know, that's for the next generation, for sure. Um, yeah. You guys, unfortunately, and, and we all need to do our part. I do my part. Uh, you guys get labeled. Uh, again, I don't agree with every decision you guys make, but you guys take, you took a beating over the wolves. And, and uh, I did my best to um, to get the word out exactly, you know, how it all. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people uh, want to point fingers and they, they point to the people that they know the most. And, uh, you know, it was... Uh, wasn't indeed fishing game that brought wolves to Idaho. It was the U S fish and wildlife service yeah. and, yeah. uh, and wolves are recovered and now we're managing them and, uh, doing our best and, uh, and hunters, uh, and trappers are helping us uh, make a difference with wolf management. And I think it's really a testament to, uh, people, um, figuring out how to get it done and, and, and doing their own, um, you know, harvesting to uh, promote uh, conservation of the of the species so i think it's it's just been it's just been great and what we've gained from two i mean 2009 was the first hunting season and then 2010 was canceled due to a, a litigation and we introduced trapping in 2011 and you know, we put over 4000 people through trapping classes for wolves because that's one stipulation in Idaho is if you're going to trap wolves and get a wolf trapping tag, you have to have had education, a trapper ed, a wolf trapper ed class. And, um, you know, just the amount of people that come from other places to learn how to do it. Um, in fact, the first gentleman to ever trap a wolf in Idaho was actually from Pennsylvania. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. He came out, he was a coyote wolf trap or coyote fox trapper from Pennsylvania. And he came out, took the class. And, uh, I wasn't the instructor in that class. I am, I am a wolf trapper instructor. And, uh, I think 10 or 11 days later, he had his first wolf and he brought it in right on. Yeah. I'll let you go, Toby. Uh, I've again, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate what you guys do. Um, yeah. And I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I think one of the things that I've learned in my 30 years of, uh, working as a wildlife biologist is, is that, you know, even though we disagree, I think the, the, the thing that we have to, that I, and I tell my staff and, you know, help them understand is that, you know, everybody has a passion. They wouldn't be at that meeting unless they were passionate about it. They might be screaming at you over one thing or another, but there are, there are nuggets in what they're saying that, that really are beneficial. And, and ultimately um, that's what we work for. We work for the people and, you know, and, and, and I think that civil discourse is good. And, and when I can help people understand uh, a situation from the data or, you know, uh, a bigger perspective, I think that's great. And I think um, there will be people that still uh, agree to disagree on things and that's fine because that's their opinion. And, and I, I can't change that and I can't change their emotions about it. And, and by golly, you know, I think it's pretty cool that they even came to the meeting to voice that because for the most part, it's hard to get people to come to public meetings to be a part of the process. I mean, really, if you want to be a part of wildlife management, you need to show up. And we're trying to do a better job of online set, you know, uh, comments and public meetings and however else we can get it out. And I think podcasts and the podcast you do is it's just another really great way that we can convey our, what we're doing that people don't know what we're doing. You know, yeah. I mean, um, they don't know all the good work that we do behind the scenes that they never see outside of hunting season. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible. So you, you've been at public meetings before where voices got raised in uh, just a few. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So that might have been me. I'm sorry. I think we've met before. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Did you come? Did you come to a meeting up in Bonner County over wolves? It was uh, the senator was sitting there with us. There was about 17 or 18 of us. 
Um, uh, yeah, it was at the uh, it was at the fairgrounds. Yep, yeah, I was I at was that meeting. So I was the guy that was all red faced. <laughs> oh no, you were just one of them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, that was. You know, I I think it's uh, you know I I think that has changed. Uh, you know that that no doubt. I mean, that's com- changed the complete complexion of how we operate as hunters, and uh, and and especially elk hunting. Um, yeah. I mean, you have all the reason in the world to be fired up about it. And, uh, you know, the more that we can do to do a better job and the more we can understand what hunters want with their opinions and attitudes, I think is super important so we can manage your resource for you. That's, yeah. that's, that's the bottom line of what we do. This won't be the last time if I can wrangle, wrangle you back on oh, here I'd, again. I'd love to come on any time uh, that you have, uh, you know, um, a need for, uh, uh, you know, somebody from the department. Uh, I also have a whole bevy of other staff that are experts on other things that, uh, I can also, uh, put in front of the camera. So perfect. Whatever Sounds works good. for you, Rob, uh, we're always here to help. And, uh, I appreciate all you do and, and getting our message and, and your message out to the, to the, to the hinterlands and, and those people that enjoy, uh, you know, every kind of archery and, and hunting in general. It's like you say, it's not just traditional guys that listen to your podcast. It's no. a lot of different people, which yep. I think is awesome. Again, you have a great day, man. Appreciate All it. All right. Take care. Take care. <laughs> yeah, bye.